So today, as uh, Bray so nicely put it, you know, he's always encouraged by my messages. Well, this week, I hope it's not going to come and hit us uh, too heavy of a topic. Today, um, as I've gone through all these, these teachings that the Lord has given me and, and allowed me the opportunity to come up here and share with everyone, it's, it refines my understanding of the gospel in itself. It refines my understanding of the word. Uh, simply because it, when you come up and, and you're presenting it to your peers, it's, you look at it in a whole different light. You look at it the aspect of uh, what we're all going through, not just in my life, but where we're walking as a body. And it seems that the Lord has given me these, these messages that kind of build on themselves in foundation, at the foundational level. Um, if you remember way back when I first had the opportunity to speak up here, um, I spoke on Ecclesiastes, which to me is the very foundation of our faith in that the life apart from God is meaningless. All, all the worldly stuff that we, we could have is meaningless apart from God. Um, and it's that hopelessness um, that we'll find apart from God. And then he was given me, he gave me the message of the woman at the well. So that is, is a clear picture of salvation, coming to God, coming to Jesus. So coming out of that hopelessness and coming into the knowledge of, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then on that, he took me to Luke 10, which is the role of the church. So now that we become saved, we become grafted and folded into his family. And we partake in the gift that the church is. We, we are his body here on earth. And on that, he, he took me into uh, 1 John, which, or I'm sorry, the Gospel of John, um, which is God's word and the understanding of, of the importance of God's word and who God's word is and that God's word has always been, and that ultimately God's word is Jesus. God, Jesus is the word made flesh, as we just had in the, the, our, one of our songs. But today, uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26, and this one's a little heavier topic, so all these, everyone wants to get out of the hopelessness of, of life and into salvation and be part of a useful body. And, and it's just a wonderful thing to understand God's word. But today we're going to be talking about the understanding of suffering. And that's a topic that unfortunately I think is, as we just were going through, uh, as we were praying for everybody, I think it's all hit us very hard lately in a lot of ways. I, I would love to say and, and point to, one particular family and say, oh, it's been hard on them this year. But really, we've been, as a body, going through a lot of struggles in the past couple of years. I think everyone can say amen to that. Amen. amen. Um, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't favor us. It doesn't mean that you know we're doing something wrong, so he's punishing us. It, here we'll see in Matthew chapter 26, and it's the, the Jesus' prayers at Gethsemane. Um, so if everyone wants to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 26, if you haven't turned there already, um, we'll be starting in verse 36, but first I want to kind of give a little, a little background to this chapter. So Jesus had just finished up at the Last Supper. He had just finished up um, with the First Communion, and he's about to be betrayed. He, he let everybody know. He let all of his disciples know exactly what was about to go on. They even, if you look in John, they were amazed at how plainly at that point Jesus was talking to them because he knew the time was running short. And so he takes his disciples to Gethsemane as, he's, as it shows that he had often done. And then on that, he goes into the, the, the garden, and then he takes Peter, Andrew, and James, and he says, let's go a little further. Um, now, this section of Scripture, when I read it for the first time as a new believer, it turned my understanding of the work of the cross upside down. I grew up in going to the Catholic Church. Uh, my parents, 
uh, took us, and they did a good job at trying to teach us. They, they really did. They, we, Sunday school, we'd go to Sunday school, we'd go, and we'd go to Mass. And, and, but again, it wasn't in my heart. It was just I understood it, but it wasn't in me. And that's the difference between a personal relationship. And, but when I would go to the Catholic Church, around just actually it's around Easter time, they would do a reenactment of the Passion, uh, when was that? Does anybody remember any of my Catholic friends? Was it on Good Friday or was it Holy Thursday? It was Good Friday. So that's when they reenacted uh, the Stations of the Cross. And, and that's when, you know, you, you're, for anyone who's ever been to that Catholic Mass, they shout out, crucify him, crucify him. Um, and Jesus just sort of, in my understanding, just sort of there, took it. He just, he was very stoic. He didn't. In all those accounts, he just sort of took the abuse. And growing up, I just viewed it as, you know, Jesus took our, our sins and took them to the cross, and it was no big deal. And I'm sitting there going like, well, yeah, if I was God, I could do that too. Um, then my own youthful ignorance, as I would like to call it. And you didn't see much emotion in, in Jesus throughout all these things. Now, I'm sure that's for a purpose, and... and what he was going through. But as we read here in Matthew chapter 26, so turn with me, and we'll pick up in verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with them Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and found them asleep, and saith unto Peter, Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same words. So, in here we have a depiction of Jesus praying that what is about to take place uh, could be remedied in some other way. Now, just like a church reading the, the Passion, crucify him, crucify him, just, just plainly reading it doesn't even begin to express the emotions involved. If we look at it closely, we can see exactly what's going on. If you see how Jesus keeps, he keeps going, he keeps moving, he, you can tell he, he can't sit still. He's if you've ever had to do something, as I'm trying up here, as I'm sitting here talking to everyone, you're going to see me moving and swaying, and I can't, you know, just trying to, to fight off the panic. Um, so he couldn't sit still and uh, just kept moving and kept coming back, and then he would go and he'd pray. Now, there's a, lot more, there's a lot more into this with the coming and praying three times, and I'm not going to get into that. But understand, he would go and he'd come back and he'd go out and he'd come back and he just couldn't sit still. And, and we see even in the words, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. And, and I remember reading that for the first time with that understanding of like, whoa, you know, I, I thought he just went to the cross and took it. I thought he just, you know, he's God, he's, you know, he man, he's going to be able to, to take it. But he was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. And at that struck me right away as a new believer is my understanding of what the work at the cross truly was. And we can get an even better perspective. That's the beautiful thing about having four Gospels. You could look at it four different ways. So we can get another perspective here in Luke. So if you'd want, turn to me with, uh, to Luke chapter 22, verse, and we're going to pick up in verse 39. And he came out and went as he went to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at that place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. 
And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou wilt remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. In, in here, that gives a whole other depiction of what? the agony and anguish that Jesus was going through at the time. We see words of being in agony, prayed earnestly. There even was sent an angel to strengthen him. So the depiction that Jesus just went to the cross because he was God and he knew he could do it was totally flipped upside down for me. And, and hopefully this, this has given that same perspective to you that that Jesus was in anguish at the cross. He was in anguish with the understanding of what was, what was taking place. And Jesus, it says here that Jesus was profusely sweating. Um, now we've got to remember if we look at who Luke was, Luke was a physician. So he was looking at things in a perspective of, somewhat of a medical perspective. I mean, obviously there weren't as... Um, advanced as we are now, but he was still analyzing it through that means. And it's funny, if you look at Luke's account, what it says to me is that Jesus was in, in a fight or flight response at the time. You could tell his, he, was, he was slightly agitated even with his disciples. That just, just that, you know, could you not watch with me one hour? And he's pacing around and he's looking around and... Uh, sweating profusely, and it even says, like, great drops of blood. And obviously it could be a metaphor of how intensely he was sweating, but there's also a medical, a, a medical anomaly that can happen when you're in intense stress, and that's your capillaries can actually break and cause you to basically sweat blood. And it was that intensity of what Jesus was going through that most likely, and, and from my perspective, and again, I'm just reading what's, what's on the page, but it shows how intense of anguish Jesus was under at this moment. And it wasn't just, oh, I got to do this thing for my dad, and, you know, and then I'll be back in three days. It was, this was an, an incredibly... Um, agonizing to Jesus and all that he had to do. Now, see, that was, that was one thing that I, I... We had the active shooter training here. If, if anyone doesn't know, our sheriff's department puts on an active shooter training. And it's the one thing I love about that course is it teaches you not just what you're supposed to do in one of those situations where if there were to be an active shooter but what your body is going to do in that level of intense anxiety. And, and basically, they're trying to get you to understand that, listen, this is what you should do, but this is what's going to actually happen. And that is your heart rate goes skyrocketing. You start sweating. You, start, you, you lose perspective. And all that they describe in those courses is exactly what's going on right now with Jesus and how intensely he's, he's under stress. And we could look even further, we get another account of the same, uh, the same situation in Mark. So if you want to turn with me real quick to uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 32. And if you want to put bookmarks in here, we're going to be kind of flopping around to these, the, the three different accounts. So if you just wanted to throw a bookmark or have something, then that way we can, I got them, so I'm cheating. So I'm going to let you guys cheat too. So Mark chapter 14, and we'll pick up in verse 32. And they came to a place which name was Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I sh shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry here and watch. And he went forward a little way and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, 
All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And that when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, neither wished they what to answer him. So basically, they, they didn't even know what to answer him. We're, we're going to go back to the disciples constantly falling asleep and, and a little later. And there was a lot to that as well. So we have here that he was, he was sore amazed. And in simple translation, you're looking at it going, oh, he was you know, kind of amazed at how stressed he was. And that wasn't exactly it. He was sore amazed, and the interpretation is he was terrified. It was, it was truly terrifying what was going on with him at that moment. Um, with the understanding of him taking our sins to the cross. It was, it was absolutely terrifying him. And now if you could think of, of Jesus being terrified in all that he went through, um, it, it's, it's kind of very humbling to what he, he did for us, he took on. And if we look at all three of these accounts of the prayers at Gethsemane, we get a clear picture of the intensity of the moment just before the cross. Looking at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I get the image of our Lord not just in anguish over the physical things he's about to endure and not just the emotional things that he's enduring. Um, here it paints a picture of God fully human taking himself the sins of the world in their entirety, not just in the acts of sin, but the fullness of the consequences of that sin. And in we look back, and I'm not going to make you turn, uh, but we look back at the original sin in the garden, and we see what entered this world when that happened. That death entered the world, sadness, toil, strife, all those things entered the world in that first sin, and there from there on. Uh, but here, here's the biggest thing, is that separation from God. And I don't think we, we truly understand that in that sin, it separates us from God. And Jesus was about to be separated from God in that sin. He was taking on our sin, and he was about to be separated from the Father for the first time. And ultimately, that's what hell is. It's, it's, it's separate from God. It's separated from God eternally. And we have the Holy Spirit with us now as a comforter, but in hell, it's, it's a true separation. He created him for that, for, to deal with sin, to deal with these things. He cannot be in the presence of sin, and that is exactly what hell is, is a separation from God. Jesus, in this moment, he was having the fullness of sin placed on him, and I don't think it's, it's truly possible for us to really understand what that means. I, it, there, there's just, there's no way to understand the fullness of that. And so, and even again, Jesus didn't try to describe it to his disciples simply because there's no way to describe it. There, there really just isn't. I think in sometimes uh, Jesus reveals to us our own sin uh, in the, in the, he meters it out to the consequence that allows us to bring us to Repentance, he, it brings us to correction. Uh, it allows us to see, in, in a way, uh, what our actions, the consequences of our actions have to those around us. I can think of, to, of Pharaoh when God wanted to let his people, or God wanted to free his people from Egypt. How God would harden, if you look in the text, it says that in times, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I think what that was, was God was metering out the revelation of the consequences that all the plagues were having on Pharaoh's people. And then he would harden them, harden his heart, and to some extent to save them. Because if he truly had an understanding of the, 
the consequences of what these plagues were having with his people, it would have destroyed him and not allowed for the purpose of freeing uh, God's people. But I think here, it wasn't metered out to Jesus. It was in its full entirety, the weight of the sin of the world was being placed on him at this moment. So we can think of the emotional, mental suffering that was generated from the entirety of the sinful world. And we think of, I can't help but think of our first responders. I don't think, well, Fred's still here. He counts. But um, think of our first responders that take care of fires, police, all that, military. All the, the struggles that they go through with mental issues and distress, PTSD, think of these things because of what they are witness to. And they're witness to a very, 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 very small portion of the consequences of sin. Not just, not just the evil that's in this world, but the sadness that comes from it. There's, there's times even in death, it's not attributed to a particular sin, but still in a fallen world. We still suffer the sadness, the loss of loved ones. We, we suffer just the sickness that comes from it. And Jesus, in that moment, is taking all of this on. And we have, our first responders have trouble with it in the small portion that they are metered it out. Um, and it's not to belittle anything that they go through. It's more of to show our human nature isn't equipped to handle the sins of the world in any way, shape, or form. And I believe when Jesus was asking for the cup to pass, or as it says in the New Living Translation, my father, if it be possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Um, it wasn't just in reference to the cross. It was in reference to the suffering of humanity. If there be any other way, can there be a different way to be reconciled? Is there any other way that we can, can be reconciled than going through this, the suffering, the death, the loss, all these things. Again, he took on the sins, the entirety of the sins of the world for now. It's, now, this was 2,000 years ago, and there's been a whole lot of sin in, from then till now. And shall the Lord tarry, I'm sure there's going to be a whole lot of sin in from now until the end of the age. And Jesus took it all on for those who believed on him. And we can only imagine what he was feeling. He's, he was feeling there's got to be another way than to go through all this. And all the, all the suffering that we've incurred in the past couple of years, I mean, that's just a small, a small portion. And Jesus took all of that on in this moment. Now, I would, I would love to be able to sit there and answer the question, why does God allow suffering? And I don't think I don't think we're capable of it. To be honest with you, I'd love to sit there and give you an answer. I've heard a lot of um, talks from a lot of different pastors that uh, are brilliant. They have brilliant minds, and they, and they come close to understanding, to to give an understanding and an explanation of of why there's still suffering in this world. But ultimately, I don't think we're ever going to come up with a conclusion that that would that we could sleep at night knowing. Um, but the only thing, and I like to tell people this if they ask about, you know, how could a good God allow suffering? Well, all I can say is that that wasn't the original plan. That wasn't his, that wasn't his intention. Um, that was something we, we defiled. Um, and, and as we look here in suffering, why does he allow suffering? Well, I don't know, but if you look at, at what he took on at the cross, it's obviously not an indifference. That's the best way I've heard it put, is that why would a good God allow suffering? Well, I don't know, but if you look at Gethsemane and the anguish that he went through, it's clear that it wasn't through indifference to us that he allows this suffering to take place, that he allows us to go through the things that we go through. In... In reference to my last message of Jesus being the Word of God in flesh, 
Um, I love how it puts it here, and I'm going to use the New Living Translation just simply because it reads a little easier. No one has ever seen the Father, but the unique one who himself, God, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. And so in this, Jesus is revealing the Father's heart towards us in the garden that um, suffering in his affliction. He's revealing God's heart towards that suffering is not an, a, a heart of indifference of, you know, you guys all deserve this, so I'm going to give you a little taste of your own medicine, and then eventually I'm going to call you home. It's... It's he understands our suffering far greater than we could ever, than we could ever understand it. And, and he is there with us. And, and Jesus here peti uh, petitions the Father, pleading for a relieving answer. You know, may this pass from us. These, we talk about all these, these loved ones today that we just, just lost within the last week, it seems. And, and we're sitting there saying, is there any other way? And, and Jesus is petitioning, is there any other way to go through this for the payment of sin? Is there any other way to avoid the suffering on earth? He didn't just ask nicely, you know, we, we, in our prayers of, you know, our holy prayers of, you know, oh, please, Father, do this for me. He was in anguish. Abba, Father, is, it's, a, it's an understanding of a very personal relationship. It's not something, it's not the formality that we bring to a church. It's Abba, Father, you know, Daddy, please don't make me do this. And he pleaded, and not only did he just, he kept going back. And, and the more anguish that he was under, the more he went back, the more earnestly he prayed. Um, to the point that there were great drops of blood sweating from him. I mean, I know for a fact, in my prayers, I've never come close to that, you know. Even no matter what's going on. But luckily for humanity, he, he accepted the Father's answer of no, and that, that's the hard one. You know, when you have a sick loved one, that's one, one area I struggle with in my prayer life, and, and even too, as, as being an elder, is, is the understanding when you pray for the sick and you pray for the weak and the dying that you, you come to it thinking that, oh, they need to get better or there's something wrong. And, and the sad answer is that sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes God's call on the lives of those around us is a greater need for him to have them than for us. And it's, it's a bitter, bitter pill to swallow. And it's a hard one to keep praying through and petitioning God when you know you've seen it so many times that the answer is no for now. And, uh, but Jesus here just keeps going back after him and he accepts that answer of no. And he drinks that cup that represents his fate. In my will, not my will, but yours. And so if you turn back with me to Matthew, I want to take a look at the disciples' reaction to this. Because I think it's important. And, and just, like, just like how Jesus, just like how Jesus' reaction in Gethsemane kind of set me back on my heels when I saw that, hey, he didn't just go to the cross, you know, as a stoic soldier going into battle. He, he went to it in anguish, understanding the fullness of it. But I, I would read these passages and I would gloss over the disciples' reaction. I'm, I'm just seeing, oh, well, they fell asleep at the wheel. The way to go, Pete, you know, at it again, you know. And as I read, even just, just for this study is when I kind of, I saw it in a different light. So if we read here in Matthew chapter 26, and I'll pick up in verse 40. And he came unto his disciples and findeth them asleep. What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went again and prayed a second time and prayed, O oh my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh to his disciples and saith unto them, 
Sleep now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And we'll flip real quick to Mark. That's where those bookmarks come into handy. And we'll pick up. In verse 37, And he cometh to find them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Could not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he come a third time, and saith, Sleep now, and take your rest. It is enough, the hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinner, sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And now a quick flip, turn to, turn to Luke. And we'll pick up in verse 45. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, that you, lest ye enter into temptation. And he yet spake, Behold, a multitude that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus and kissed him. So we, we read here in Luke, this is what just, just set me back. If you look at that, it said, They were sleeping for sorrow. Now I took it always beforehand, I took that, as they were sleeping simply because they were asleep at the wheel. They didn't understand the situation. But if you read here, they were sleeping for sorrow. And I think of all that the disciples had gone through, what they, the, the stress that they were under following Jesus. They had just given up their whole livelihoods. They've given up everything. They walked away from family. They walked away to follow Jesus. And this whole time, Jesus keeps telling them that, listen, I'm going to be, be betrayed into the hands of sinners. I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die. And I'm going to be taken away. And the fullness is coming into fruition as, as Jesus was speaking with them. If you look in John, was speaking to them clear, clear to the point where they were almost astonished at how clear God was talking to them at this point. And my understanding now is that they weren't, they weren't asleep at the wheel. They were exhausted from grief. Uh, I think the New Living Translation describes it just as that. They were exhausted from grief and all that they were going through. And I can't help but think what we've all been going through. And each time we come up here and mention another one of our body has gone home to the Lord. Now, it's a wonderful, great, amazing thing. But it still takes us back. You know, it still is like it's it's still exhausting to keep hearing the news and to know that, you know, another 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 one of our loved ones is we're not going to be able to see them until we're in glory. And these disciples, I can't help but feel the same way, is that you just sit there and you go, I can't do it anymore. I can't, I can't with Jesus over there, because obviously it's a stone's throw away, and the sound of the anguish that Jesus was under. They obviously heard him. And I think they were just like, I just can't do this anymore. I can't, in my own strength, I can't take it. I cannot take on the sins of the world. And I thought it was funny, not funny, but I thought it was, was interesting to read these contradictory statements that Jesus mentioned. And just for the sake of going back to the beginning, we're going to go back to Matthew I, I, I'm pretty sure I don't have any more flipping around, so I think we're good. And uh, <laughs> we look here, and cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. So he basically said, Now sleep on, take your rest. And in the same sentence, he goes, rise up. And I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. But he understood. He prayed for, he, 
he was trying to tell them, don't, don't enter into the temptation of fleeing from me in this hour. Don't, don't go away. But he knew full well. He was preparing them, knowing full well what they were, what they were going to do to him. And they were just going to leave him. So basically, what he, he understood their hearts and that they were exhausted and that they couldn't take any more grief. They couldn't take any more um, stress. They couldn't take any more. They were just exhausted to the point of even in the midst of this tense situation, they were still falling asleep. Think of a soldier in war, you know, sleeping up against his tank, you know. He just done. He had enough. He needs to take a break. And Jesus said to him, sleep now and take your rest. So he's, he's basically telling him, okay, you guys can go now. Because he understood fully that that's what they were going to do. So he was going to give them that rest. And that was a game changer for me to see his reaction. Because I never really paid attention to it. But I think because of all that we've been going through and where my heart is at is that I understood what they were, where they were in that moment. And instead of just being asleep at the wheel because they were interested in other things, they were exhausted from all that they had been through. And then to, to find out that this is, as the situation was intensifying, they just, they, they couldn't do it anymore in their own strength. It's, it's so easy to view the, the disciples as screw-ups and, and not weight their actions to all that they're going through. But they had been through so much. And uh, we as well, um, in this day and age, it seems like the, that level of intensity is, is, is growing as well within our church. Now, here in this country, we don't even know what persecution really is. Um, but you could see that the... It's not as easy as it used to be. It's not as well accepted as it used to be. There's a lot of, to, to live a biblical life, there's a lot of opposition that, that keeps coming up. And as Jesus prayed, I pray the same thing, that we enter not into temptation. And in the midst of all these things that are going on, that we don't fall asleep. Because we've got to remember that these disciples didn't have the Holy Spirit at this time. They didn't have... They were walking with Jesus, and Jesus was under anguish at this time, and they still were a ways off from receiving the Holy Spirit. And they couldn't handle the fullness of sin. None of us can. And they hadn't been given the Holy Spirit, and they hadn't been strengthened. We are incapable, incapable of handling the weight of sin, both the punishment and consequences of it, and our own strength. It's far, far great, too great a burden to carry. And you see that, again, as I mentioned, that the mental health crisis that um, we see in our military first responders. And actually, there is even in our pastors, now not our pastor, I'm not trying to make that accusation, but in the world, if you look in, at, at church groups, that is a real thing that they're concerned about is the mental health of pastors. Because they're deep in the thick of it, in, in the sins of the people in their congregation. And it's just too far a great of a burden for us to carry. And, and Jesus addressed this with James and John already. And I think that's why James and John were with him. And shortly before, and I'm not going to have you turn to it, uh, but in Mark, in chapter 10, I, I like Mark because we're studying Mark, so I like to keep referencing back to Mark for you guys. But James and, and John petitioned Jesus. He, they said, we, we want to sit at your right hand when you're in glory. We want, we want to be those two that are sitting there right with you. And he turns back to him and says, you don't know what you're asking for. And, and everyone wants to be a hero, but not, not many are willing to go through what it takes to be. And truly, even fewer actually want to go through it. And so... Jesus goes to his disciples, and, and though they're well-intentioned, and they want to rule with Jesus, and they want to be uh, important, Jesus is telling them, you don't know what you're asking for to have to go through it. You can't, you can't in your strength go through it. He says, you will. He goes, you will, be, you will take part in it. 
but to be at my right hand, you don't, you don't know what you're asking for. You can't handle it. You don't want, I don't want to handle it. But you definitely can't handle it. As much as love as he had for them. And as much as I can't give an explanation of why they're suffering, I can tell you that its existence in no way denies the existence of our Creator. A lot of times people's, people's argument is, you know, if there's a good God, how can He allow suffering? And it in no way shows that. It in no way shows an indifference towards us from our Creator. Um, and it in no way proves a lack of our salvation. It, no longer, it, it in no way proves that, hey, you can't truly be saved. If you were saved, you'd be saved from suffering. And that in no way shows that. What it does prove is God's love toward us, that in our sinful state, Christ fully bared the consequences of our sin in the shame and the guilt and the sorrow and the sickness and death that is a consequence of our fallen world. Although we may not understand it, we shall see and experience suffering in this world as we have and had our fair share lately. The prayers of Jesus in Gethsemane prove his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He bore the suffering so that we may be uh, comforted and inherit eternal life if we put our faith in the work of the cross and what Jesus did and that Jesus was sent to save us from our sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the gift of the comforter of the Holy Spirit that you give us, Lord. And I, I just thank you so much for the gift of the cross um, that you bore our sins, that you, you took it upon yourself, Lord, and, and in the suffering that we, we do partake in, Lord, that we don't partake it alone as you did in the garden, Lord. And uh, I just lift up to you this message to the, to the ears that hear it, Lord. I just pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So if you all